Tiger Crisis Podcast Episode 4. Uh, we are the podcast that uh, follows uh, Tiger King, uh, Netflix documentary. We do admit uh, at this point in the, in the uh, podcast that there are some limitations to having a podcast based completely as an after show for a show that probably won't have a second season. Uh, so we'll admit that uh, fault as we move forward here. Uh, and we'll figure out what happens after we get through this whole process uh, of the Tiger King situation. But right now, as part of coronavirus, COVID, the lockdown, the quarantine, uh, we hope that you're all being safe out there and, and being responsible as people. And there's really nothing more fun than to binge these ridiculous shows um, and try to understand what it is that we're doing as a society to make these things gain the value that they have. I think it is very uh, indicative of the times that this Tiger King thing has exploded the way that it has. I mean, there are plenty, there are plenty of pages on Reddit, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter that are like basically defending Joe Exotic, uh, Talking shit about Carol Baskin and then sort of like trolling Jeff Lowe. Uh, if you if you do a, a quick easy Google search uh, at this point, you can find Jeff Lowe's uh, advertised phone number, and it seems that he is taking phone calls from uh, anyone who happens to be a woman and wants to FaceTime. That's kind of where his life is at right now. Uh, so. Looking at the Tiger King documentary episode four, it is called Playing With Fire. And as you guys know, it's um, it's sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek play on words, but then it also ends the episode with this big fire uh, that no one seems to be responsible for, or as the documentary makers will have it, you think everyone is responsible for. Um, the big thing with episode four is, as a whole, what really happens is this is the first time we kind of feel sorry for Joe Exotic. The The big outline of episode four is that Joe, who we're in love with, we open up the episode uh, with one of Joe's songs. Uh, it's, it's him doing his country song. By the way, he has a, a wonderful catalog. It looks as though that there is songs called I Saw a Tiger, My First Love. There's that one where he's... Um, claiming that Carol fed her husband two tigers. Then he had came out with a bunch of uh, uh, songs in 2020 from prison, one of them called Because You Love Me, another one called Here Kitty Kitty. Uh, so he has a catalog now. I also think Joe has locked jaw. I, I've never seen somebody who sings in the intonation and, and tone. I, I don't know the words I want. I, he has a completely different singing voice in country than he does... In real life, it's very strange. Um, he he sort of he speaks like a guy who does meth in Oklahoma, and then he sings like an angel from Texas. And, and what's funny is in the beginning of episode four is actually they were following him around in his car. He's got a he's got like a full size tiger in the front seat of his truck, and he's karaokeing. He's carpool karaokeing to his own song, and even when he sings it himself in his car. Uh, he does not have his own singing voice. So that's that's a super interesting thing. Um, what we really learn in this episode is that Joe Exotic would have done anything to become famous. And what's amazing is now he is famous. There's something about this character that is like root, rootable. I don't know. Like we, we want him to win in a lot of ways. We, we like and episode four really goes a long way towards letting us feel bad for him. Um, but I think it's weird. I think we really need to have a, a real discussion in the world about the fact that this is what entertainment has become. We only sort of envy people and respect people that we would never hang out with. Uh, the, the mark of reality TV now is sort of designed to make us feel better about ourselves. And in my relationship now and, and, uh, and who I'm quarantined with, uh, I have to keep pointing out the fact that watching these sort of like rumor mill type shows with negativity, like I'll wake up and the TV's on like one of these entertainment, Bravo, uh, E, like these type of channels. And it's just people arguing. And there's something that we've created that 
makes us feel good that we just watch people argue all day long. And what's super consistent in the Tiger King documentary is that throughout the entire thing, everyone has a problem with everyone. It's like the most like, like job, college, high school, ticky tacky, like rumor talking smack about anybody that you possibly could have. And it's become these people's identity. There's a guy, Rick Kirkman, uh, who uh, like agreed to film Joe uh, so that he could also on the back end film a reality show. And he's there talking smack about Joe. Uh, we got Joe who ends up devoting his entire life to trying to shut down another person, Carol Baskin, in her career. And then Carol spends the time to uh, make her life about shutting down his life and his career. So it's just a weird element that we've created, I think, especially right now in the times that we're in, in the coronavirus, in the, in the COVID-19 era, now that we're with loved ones and we're shacked up with people and we're all scared and some of us are losing people that we know and some people are um, coming down with this disease and the rest of us are just terrified of what could happen. And it really highlights like what's important in life right now. And this shouldn't be it guys okay as much as this is a fun uh podcast to, to produce and as much as this is a fun show to watch you, you watch this thing and then when you realize during the episode that we're trying to feel bad for joe exotic that's a weird position to be in um because it's a, it's a very needy narcissist man who's main who makes everything about him and really wants to be the he wants to be the tiger king he wants he wants this title to be real a uh, good portion of this episode was uh talking about how he just replays over and over again this sort of like superhero like i think they call it like the god shot uh, that they came up with him they built him this big throne and they keep uh, panning in, going up, you know, and then swooping in on him with this big superhero cinematic thing calling him the Tiger King. And he ends up thinking that that's who he is and that's what the situation is. And that's and that's who he needs to be. Um, in this Instagram, TikTok, like, internet famous society that we've created, this is a monster. And... Joe, who's behind bars for a murder for hire scheme that never gets itself off the ground, that has no proof and no details, Joe is going to end up coming out of prison and being one of the biggest things on the planet. And that doesn't feel that doesn't feel right to me, especially right now in these times. And as a comedian, you know, one of my main preoccupations is to try to figure out how to make tragedy hilarious and that's i mean this documentary does it all on its own the the absurdity that's been created with these characters the impersonations that have been going around all of the things they're there um but there is something that feels wrong about this this piece of entertainment and the fact that this is going to be someone who after this documentary and after this prison run the way politics are shaking, shaping up, I find it far-fetched to think that it would be impossible for Joe Exotic to run for president. Uh, and then this thing with Donald Trump claiming that he's going to pardon Joe for fun, that's... That sounds like a joke until you take into consideration who this president is. So... There's just something wild going on in the air with this whole Tiger King documentary scenario. I think as a documentary as a documentary creator, I think you have a responsibility to the viewership in some way. And I already argued uh, after the first episode that I don't think that this is a uh, a true crime documentary in any way. I think it's it's a fully a reality show. Um, but there is a, there's something that happens in this episode and it's this big fire. Again, the, the, the episode is called Playing With Fire, episode four of Tiger King. And what happens is, uh, there's a fire on the premise, the GW Zoo, and it's in the middle of a big lawsuit and it's in the middle of this guy, Rick Kirkham or Kirkman, um, 
creating a, a, a reality show for Joseph Joe at this point in time has a reality show and he has his own live show and the live show is basically him uh, taking out his his grief with Carol Baskin and, and and making a scene call doing the thing with the with the Carol Baskin killing her husband all these sorts of things and a building burns down on the property and a bunch of animals die and a bunch of footage is lost and as far as the documentary is concerned, they go as far as to blame Kirkman. They go as far as to blame Carol. They said Carol paid somebody to have the thing burnt up. They said that Joe could have burnt it up on his own. Really, as a documentary, they're not responsible in the way that you would want them to be uh, as far as coming up with some kind of conclusion. So this episode largely is just sort of a mess, uh, and it starts to feel like... Um, the, the hand of, of sympathy is being created, again, for Joe. So basically, if you don't remember, episode four is basically the saga of Joe Exotic deciding that he's going to start another company called Big Cat Rescue Entertainment because he's figured out that Carol Baskin has figured out Facebook. She, at, that, at this point in time, she's getting $20,000, $30,000 a week in Facebook, GoFundMe pages, uh, she's doing ads on Facebook. She's got all this money now from the from the from the husband uh, funding and all the things that she was able to inherit in his death. Um, so Joe basically starts a company that's almost the identical name as Carol Baskin, and then of course uh, in two seconds they find out that uh, he's doing that because Carol and her crew start getting phone calls that are asking if people can come and pet uh, pet cubs and all these sort of like Joe related uh, things. Joe has now taken up ads that have Florida numbers on them where he's in Oklahoma and she's in Florida. So she's, he's got her Florida number now. He's got basically her name all the way to the end of it. He started a website called 911animalrescue.org, which I think is like one website away from Carol Baskin's and the, the header on that website is looking for Don Lewis's remains, all of these things. So as soon as this breaks, Carol and her husband, uh, Howard Baskin, sue Joe. And basically with all this money that they have from all of the, um, the, the inheritance, they start a lawsuit against Joe. Uh, admittedly, it sounds like their goal was to basically have Joe just stop using the name Big Cat Rescue Entertainment and stop infringing on their rights as a, as a company. But instead, what happens is Joe, either in his stead of arrogance or in his misunderstanding the law, he decides that he's going to fight this thing. So Joe ends up you know, doubling down on the situation, starts bringing more and more eyes to the website, more and more uh, eyes to like anti-Carol stuff. He's doing all this anti-Carol stuff on his show. So now they're suing him also for like defamation and libel. Um, and he start, he's like holding protests in Florida rather than dealing with his, uh, his own responsibilities at his GW Zoo. And as it turns out, it starts to seem... Uh, from the documentary's perspective, that Carol and Howard have put up about a, uh, $1 million uh, in legal fees fighting Joe on this, on this, on this suit. Um, here's the sad thing. Because it's a bunch of people that really don't understand the law, and, and, I'm, and that's just, I mean, that might be my opinion, but if you watch a documentary and you hear these people talking, Joe is like, at the end of the result, is sort of like upset about that he didn't get his day in court. But uh, Howard, the, the Baskin, the lawsuit creator, even said, like, all this guy had to do was stop using the name Big Cat Entertainment and then the lawsuit would have been over. What I think what a lot of people don't understand is in a civil lawsuit, I can sue you uh, as, a, as an individual, and you know, especially not as a company. And if I win, um, that's a win, but anything that comes from a monetary perspective because you're not a corporation um, kind of cannot be collected. Like there's no actual apparatus set up to get my money. I could sue you for a million dollars and you could just never pay me. And there's sort of no other um, consequences, right? That's just sort of how civil suits work. 
So Joe ends up in this situation. He ends up uh, getting sued by Carol and Howard. He doubles down. So he looks like a real piece of work because he's doing all of these things. He's calling Carol all these names. He's showing pictures of rabbits on the internet that Carol's feeding to tigers. He's showing up at Carol's front door in bloody rabbit uh, outfits, putting it on the internet, doing everything he can in that, in that sense. And the judge looks at this, says, we don't need a trial. This is shenanigans. Uh, and, he, and he grants the $1 million lawsuit uh, for Joe. Now, Joe, as a response, then starts panicking and starts trying to figure out how to pay Carol and all these things for all of this stuff. So then there's this weird, like, Joe and, and Carol's husband, Howard, going back and forth trying to figure out how uh, they're going to pay for the lawsuit, how, how Joe's going to pay for the lawsuit. And they tell him he's got to start paying X number of dollars a month. And here's where it gets real ugly. And this is, and then this is like the prime uh, chunk of like starting to feel sorry for Joe in this, in this kind of experience is that Carol somehow gets a list of all of Joe's assets and then starts uh, itemizing them and then asking for Joe to give them up. So she ends up taking a bus from Joe, She like, which I think he might be living in at the time. She ends up taking, um, let's see, what else does she take from him? She takes, a, she takes a semi truck from him. She basically shuts Joe's ability to go to malls and tour tigers and, and, uh, and this sort of thing, which is a big part of his income, away from him. Uh, and then Joe in his, like, surrounded by camera crew, not getting any good advice from anybody, surrounded by two dudes who might not be gay, who are his husbands, who are doing meth all the time, uh, surrounded by a woman whose arm got eaten off, who then is so loyal to Joe that she just says it's cool as long as the cats don't get taken away. He's surrounded by all these people in this hick Oklahoma environment uh, where nobody's really making good decisions. And then instead of trying to come to terms with the thing. He just starts taking videos of him taking items off of the Carol Baskin list and blowing up. He said, Carol, you want my watch? And then he blows it up. Carol, you want my bed? And then he blows it up and puts it on the internet. Here's what gets real ugly. The Carol and Howard thing. Um, and, and again, I don't know. I don't know what the real spin is on the documentary end of this, but this episode really like frames a situation where Howard and Carol are shitbags and Joe is just this sort of like sad, um, misunderstood and taken advantage of guy. So what ends up happening is Howard and, and, and um, Joe end up on the phone to start negotiating. And then in the midst of that whole thing, Howard and Carol start suing like groundskeepers at the zoo. They're suing like the janitor at the zoo. They sue uh, Joe's mother. And there's this very sad scene in episode four where uh, Joe's mother and father are like in a GoFundMe video uh, talking about how they're out of money and they need to they need some money to be able to fight Carol Baskin in the lawsuit. And then what's great is, of course, Joe's mother starts talking shit about Carol Baskin in a very... Uh, Let's just call her uh, Mrs. Exotic kind of way. So the whole, the whole experience of that episode ends up becoming this sad tale of a man who doesn't understand the law, doesn't really understand um, what his life goal is. This is, what, this is what's crazy. Is it, it, I know a lot of us don't ever figure out what we're supposed to do with our lives. But at the beginning of the documentary, at the beginning of the four years, you could, you could argue that Joe has a thriving business. He's figured out a way, albeit uh, kind of shady, to, to have employees that are, don't have anywhere else to go, give them meth, give them dick, give them uh, Walmart meat for free, give them homes, give them places, give them tigers. I think he's running... Uh, couple hundred animals at the time around the park, keeping them alive. He's got bears, he's got tigers, he's got wolves. He's figured out this Walmart thing. He's a very ingenious man. He's figured out how to make this thing work. Again, albeit in kind of a shady, sketchy sort of like, um, if you have to get drugs and are meth addicted, figure out a way to get drugs every day, like that kind of realm. 
but he's making it work. And, and there's a respect level to that. And he's working hard at it. And then he gets all caught up in the Carol Baskin debacle. And he loses sight of running a zoo and running uh, a responsible establishment for these animals. And even being the the weird sideshow star that he was. I mean, what was great about Joe in the first four episodes is that he's running this business successfully. People are coming out in Oklahoma, man. I mean, look, Oklahoma touches um, New Mexico, Oklahoma touches Kansas, Oklahoma, I think touches Missouri. It's a state away from, it touches Texas. It's a state away from uh, like Colorado. I mean, this guy had the Midwest and whatever, you know, extending into sort of like that Rocky Mountain area locked down for having like a weird backyard tiger park and people were coming and people were spending money and people were there. They were petting cubs, all of the things. And he gets caught up in this lawsuit and he sort of loses to this woman who, let's be honest, Carol's a winner. Uh, Carol, Carol never loses. Uh, if you're her husband and it's not going good for her, she'll find a way to pull through. So that is, that is sort of a big takeaway of the episode is that Carol will not be beaten and she will do whatever it takes, uh, limb, life, and dollar bill to make sure that she wins. And she's manipulated this other man to being her sidekick and her bulldog. This whole episode four is like Carol's will spoken through Howard. That's what I think is super interesting. If you watch the episode, it's a bunch of interviews with Howard Baskin where she's sitting right next to him, almost, almost as if he's her marionette. Every other interview with Carol prior to this moment in the documentary is, is her by herself telling weird stories, um, denying murders, all the things that she does. And then all of a sudden this episode, because Howard's involved in the lawsuit and sort of um, kind of the face of the lawsuit, Carol is there sitting next to him. It's the only... I think it's the only interview in the documentary where it's two people side by side and it's weird that only one of them is talking and it feels weird and it feels like Carol has this control over the guy. Um, so it is, it's a weird, it's a weird episode and it's, and, and it really, it's largely around the, the Howard and Joe interaction, the Carol and Joe interaction through Howard. And then they keep throwing in this mix with this uh, Rick Kirkham character who thinks he's figured out um, this great reality show that could exist what, to call Tiger King, which is crazy because we watched exactly that. So, you know, in a sense, if, if Rick was responsible enough and vigilant enough and not coming on the documentary to talk shit about people, arguably he should have had this thing made five years ago. I mean, obviously, Joe is a character that we all kind of oddly root for and care about. It's just weird. I think Joe is somebody in all of our families. I think we all have the, this character in our family who shouldn't make it work, but somehow it does. Uh, and whatever his secrets are, so however he, however he, he makes uh, the miracles that he makes and whatever magic he uses, uh, you know, it would, there's just this guy who, who somehow keeps landing on his feet like a tiger uh, until he goes head to head with Carol Baskin. So the end of the, the end of the episode rather is sort of this, like, like Joe is, has his back on the wall. He doesn't know what to do. He's involved in this lawsuit that feels like he didn't need to be involved in. He's stuck, uh, with these payments that he's agreed to $5,000 a month. Carol is asking for Joe to have his mother, put her house up for collateral because Joe at this point doesn't own anything. They're telling Joe basically, look, you can't breed cubs or have cub petting. Uh, Joe says, look, that's my income. How do you expect me to get you $5,000 a month if I can't do those things? And then this weird character comes out of the woodwork at the end of this episode. And again, it's like we're, 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 Two episodes in, three episodes in, then, then like we're doing a whole uh, experience with Carol and her husband in episode three and the murder. Episode two is just sort of like this who owns tigers and what are the sex games involved. Uh, episode one is trying to introduce everybody. And then all of a sudden in episode four, 
this other weird benefactor comes out of the woodwork, this Jeff Lowe character, and all of a sudden, all we know about Jeff Lowe is he drives a Lamborghini or Ferrari and impresses everybody. He puts uh, tigers in Louis Vuitton purses and has his sex parties in Las Vegas where he has people and girls come up and pet tigers. And the guy is even on camera talking about, uh, what did he say, a little pussy gets you a lot of pussy. So all of a sudden, we get this other villainous character side by side with Joe. Jeff walks in, apparently. This is the way it's presented to us. Jeff walks in, says, look, I understand that you're a good dude, that you're being, um, like, sued and, and overrun by Carol. I got, like, five tigers that I need to put somewhere. Why don't I help you out? Why don't I flip the bill for, the, for all your lawsuits and we'll get you out of the deal? So Jeff Lowe walks in. They're on a phone call. Uh, dealing with the, the $5,000 payment. Carol has just asked for Joe's mother's house. And Jeff Lowe says, F this, F that, C word this, C word that, and pays off, uh, hangs up the phone, pays off Joe's lawyers at a discounted rate, writes a cashier's check, it dissolves the company, and in five seconds, all of a sudden, is the president of GW Zoo and from that moment uh, becomes the new owner of Joe's entire legacy. Um, so if you do look at the whole episode, it's just this sad man who gets taken advantage of in a lot of ways because of his weird greed, his weird want, uh, need to be famous, and his weird like um, narcissism to create a celebrity around a thing that... Just should have been a fun sideshow backyard zoo. It really is weird because there are these zoos everywhere around the country. Like if I Google um, tigers near me, uh, just right now, straight up. Uh, well, okay. So first of all, I live in New York City, so I, have, I get a ton of uh, I get a ton of zoos nearby. But then within three search th uh, uh, planes, I get tiger cubs to buy. And buy exotic pets like it's an Amazon. Like I can just buy a tiger for $2,000. And then if you look at a map, best tiger sanctuaries in the U.S. There's one just, there's one like right by me uh, in New Jersey. There's one in, in uh, Myrtle Beach. We know which one that is. Uh, there's two in Florida. We know which one of those is. There's one in, I guess, what does this look like? I think this is Louisiana. Uh, there's two in Indiana, two side by side in Texas, uh, one in, uh, I don't know, Nevada, two in California, one in Washington, one in, uh, what looks like, uh, Wisconsin. Where's this one? And then this one's in, this one is in, this was called Wild Animal Sanctuary. And this one is, is in Denver, Colorado. I mean, these things are so crazily placed that you can just get to tigers from pretty much every state. The only place where there isn't one is Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, which nobody lives there. So there's no reason for anything to exist up there. And there's not any in Alaska because uh, a fucking tiger is not going to live for very long in Alaska. Uh, it's going to go nuts, with, especially with the, with the non-light, all-light thing. But at the end of the day, uh, Joe becomes our hero in episode four. This is the moment. This is the shining moment where all of a sudden we are in the Joe exotic business. Up until this moment watching this documentary, you feel sorry for the man and you feel, or sorry, you feel, you just, you don't know how you feel about the guy. You're like, look, he's a meth guy. He's kind of fun. He's a total character. We know that. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're sort of, um, we're looking at him as the, the hero of the story and definitely one of the most uh, interesting people in the experience. And then all of a sudden he's our sad, um, like victim. And now we really, really start to feel for Joe. And because we know where this thing ends, we know that, that the whole thing ends with Joe being in prison. This sort of seems like the apt moment in the documentary to really launch the, the bigger picture, which is that, uh, that we should be feeling sorry for Joe uh, in, in all of his experiences. The, the opening sequence is, like I said, the tiger, Joe, playing his own song, trying to sing his own song. And then it's, it's, a, um, it's a recording of Joe calling from prison uh, and talking about Carol Baskin's 
ability to be the number one search uh, hit for anything, tiger, cat, etc. So they're framing us as, as audience members in a very specific way to feel the way that we feel. So this is sort of the first time when you go back and watch where you realize what the manipulation of the documentary is. And again, I, I, I respect that. From a documentary filmmaker position, I respect taking a stance, making the audience feel a certain way. I think, it's, I think it's foolish of us as people to come out of watching a documentary feeling a certain way and thinking that we've come to that conclusion on our own. Every documentary has its own perspective that it's trying to stack. So whatever information that they, that they put in whatever order, they want you to feel a certain way. And we have to respond to the fact that we are being manipulated. It doesn't always have a sinister uh, goal in mind, right? Uh, and in this case, especially, it's an entertainment-esque goal in mind. But we have to take consideration. We have to be responsible to understand that we are being manipulated, even if it's in the smallest way. So this this thing, I mean, the whole the whole show is still called Tiger King, and that's Joe's name. And we're in this position where we start to kind of wish Joe was our friend, and we kind of we kind of like all the weird quirkiness that he that he. Uh, um, inhabits and exhibits there's something fun about if joe was your friend and you could just go hang out and like play with tigers how that would be like a really enriching fun thing in your life there's so many people in this documentary that come forward at certain points and um talk about being involved with joe or being involved with tigers or being involved in experiences uh for the animals more than anything else it's like Joe is one person that uh, kind of isn't harming anybody. I mean, you would argue differently since he is right now in prison for uh, paying somebody to harm somebody. But at this point in time, it seems very far-fetched that this uh, whole plot could take place. And, you know, if you have watched the whole thing, as a lot of us have, it does feel, even at the end, like there are a lot of unanswered questions. And it feels like uh, it's okay. And... Um, respectable to not get an answer as a as a law enforcement agency in these southern states and i, I don't know why that is the fact that we don't get an answer about uh, what happened to carol baskin's husband from any law perspective the fact that we don't get an answer about what happens to uh, joe's uh, burnt up studio that supposedly lost all the footage lost all these uh, alligators we don't know who did it uh, the, the Oklahoma cops basically are quoted being like, well, look, we know that it's an arson, uh, but we don't have any more information. There's just something gross about this whole experience where it's just a lot of crimes being committed without any solutions. And if you've listened to the other episodes of this thing, uh, the Tiger Crisis podcast, we, my claim is pretty much you can get away with most crimes, uh, including murder as long as uh, you're a little bit smart about it. And I think a, a good contributing factor, a large contributing factor to being able to get away with large crimes is to do them in areas like rural Oklahoma, where there's really no reason to have a, a police force and a, and a investigation team that actually has any skills. Um, the smaller you go in a, in, a, in a population perspective from a town, the more you realize that just sometimes those positions are filled because they needed to fill those positions. And, and don't get me wrong, I come from a small town. Uh, I come from a place called Baldwinsville, New York. And I'm sure there are plenty of people doing jobs that um, they're only doing because... Uh, nobody else had the job. And I, and I get it. Look, especially in this country, uh, sometimes you just work f in your family business. Sometimes you just do what's close and easy. Sometimes uh, you just take an opportunity that's in front of you. But there's something weird about the fact that all of these crimes kind of go 
unsolved and there's just this whole sea experience or surrounding the whole the whole thing um but one thing is undeniable joe is a lovable dude um if you troll the internet now like i do with the tiger king uh memes and all the stuff a lot of people want to be friends with joe and there's a lot of jokes out there about you know how all you need is is a little bit of meth and a tiger and then you got yourself a husband um but then there's also people actually like throwing themselves at Joe on the internet. Like there are women that are saying, oh, it's too bad that Joe's gay because I could give him a good time. And there's just this weird, weird thing that's floating around. And when you really look at it, Joe represents a lot of what the United States is about. And, you know, and I, and I hate, and I hate that that's, that that's true in a lot of ways, but, uh, uh, if basically you are committed to your convictions, um, you can kind of do whatever you want with your life. You can be a gun-toting, uh, slur-yelling, uh, party-whatever, tiger-owning, curse-word-spewing individual who runs for president uh, with almost no experience in any of the things uh and that's the more we continue down this path uh the more this continues to be true i the reason why this podcast is late by the way is because i was i was in uh, the emergency room last night and it was not for uh corona related uh involvement but it was very scary to be in there during a pandemic uh, it was very quiet and very contained, and I was in a very much of a different area than anybody else that, had, that would have had corona. But I got to speak to a lot of the, the people that work in that environment and see what is happening and how they feel about everything. And then I got to uh, hear some nurses talking on their own, and they all uh, started talking about the Donald Trump drinking disinfectant comments. Basically, last night, uh, Donald Trump was quoted in the uh, White House press room saying that UV radiation has been shown to kill bacteria, kill the virus. Um, is there any way that we can put this inside the body to kill the virus? And then the other thing is that disinfectants have been uh, found to eliminate the virus immediately. Is there any way that we can put these into the body? And then he looked at his medical team and said, you know, this is something for medical doctors to figure out. Maybe you guys can get on top of this. And then one day later, uh, everyone asked him, hey, what did you mean when you said, um, like, let's come up with a way to put disinfectant inside the body to kill the virus? And he said, well, obviously I was being sarcastic. And this is... The more you watch this documentary, the more, the more you realize, especially when we get into the Joe Exotic uh, presidential run, how close Joe Exotic is to our current president. And there's something wild about that. And I, I imagine that this will not be a very popular opinion, but there really is a, a Trumpian quality to doubling down whenever you're challenged. And this is what this entire episode four is about. Joe makes a mistake he starts a company that is big cat rescue entertainment it's clearly somebody else's business and they go you can't do that just don't do it just take your name off of it just stop just stop your company big tiger entertainment nobody's asking you to do anything with the zoo just stop making videos with my fucking name and he goes no, i'm not gonna do that i have a right to do this it's my country it's my world i can do whatever i want and he just doubles down on the on the insults and the experience, and it ends up biting him in the ass because Carol Baskin will not lose. Um, and throughout the whole process, he has a hundred opportunities to bail, and he doesn't. And and actually, the final solution is when Jeff Lowe steps in. Jeff Lowe pays off Joe's old um, attorney bills, thirty thousand dollars, and then all he does is say, "Hey, uh, cancel Big Cat Entertainment," like like. Uh, like dissolve the company and start a new company and just put my name in the zoo and then Carol and them have to start a new lawsuit and then that's all they did and then it was done which means at any point during this lawsuit process they said in the document that Joe spends uh, $250,000 fighting Carol Baskin and Carol ends up spending about a million dollars of real money trying to sue Joe 
Um, at any point in this process, all Joe had to do was dissolve his company, change the name, and just go on with his life. And he didn't. Against all advice, against uh, like all logic, just just operated on pure ego and pure no, I said it, so now my will be, will be done type of energy. And that's the world that we're living in today. And Joe is a perfect example. And our president is a perfect example of how this behavior can sort of backfire. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I'm in lockdown. I'm in quarantine. Um, and every single day there is an experience that is uh, being cast across the Internet that is a complete 180 from the day before. And the, the rhetoric is that the 180 that we did yesterday to today never happened. So there's just this push and pull that keeps going back and forth where we have not accomplished as much as we've said we, we have, but then the whole thing is patting ourselves on the back. And that's a very American thing, to pat ourselves on the back, deny our responsibility, and to continue to just push through regardless of uh, results. I think episode four is a perfect uh, allegory for the fact that we need to take personal responsibility as human beings, sometimes say that we're sorry, sometimes say that we did the thing that we did, um, accept the consequences and move forward. Um, and if you don't do that, disastrous things can happen. Uh, someone can sue you for a million dollars. You can be convinced that they will get it, even though you know you don't have a million dollars. Um, and then someone else can just come out of the woodwork and buy your company for pennies on the dollar um, out of sheer will and confusion. And then in a six-month span, your entire life's work is gone because you're trying to out-confidence everybody. Uh, I don't know how that translates as much to, to what's happening or the consequences, hopefully, that there will be for being this type of... Uh, figurehead in this country, but we'll see what happens moving forward. Um, to say nothing of the fact that it is an interesting period of time, uh, I don't think there has ever been a better period of time for Joe Exotic, Mr. Tiger King, to be our uh, misunderstood victim hero. Uh, I think if this program came out 10 years ago, um, Joe would have been an easy punchline, and, and there would have been no uh, love and emotion behind it. But I think we are in a, in, a, in a very specific period of time where this is Joe's 15 minutes to become the greatest Tiger King he could become. And, and we've done it. Uh, so this is episode four. This is Tiger Crisis. Uh, we're trying to figure out more and more what we want the format of this thing to be. Uh, I think we're going to try in the future here to get some interviews with some of the cast members of the program uh, and so on and so forth. But, but uh, up until this point, there's a lot of dense material in this documentary that needs to be sifted, and uh, we're going to try our best to do it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you much so much for watching. We're on uh, Anchor app. It's where we create the, the podcast. And uh, we're on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio. we got some YouTube content. Uh, thank you guys for uh, participating. If you want to support directly, uh, there are links all over the Internet for ways that you can donate to us and be a part of this program. Uh, if you want to send us your questions, comments, uh, dan at tigercrisis.com.